Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. Today's guest host for the episode is our very own Mitchell Space Power fellow, Tim Ryan. Hey, thanks a lot, Slick. This week, we're really excited. We're going to talk about General Saltzman, the Chief of Space Operations, Theory of Competitive Endurance. Now, here's what you need to know about this. It's focused on integrated defense, space superiority, and ensuring access to the space domain. And it has three tenets that underpin it. Avoiding operational surprise, denying a first-mover advantage, and responsible counter-space campaigning. Now, the chief has also challenged Guardians to discuss and develop this theory. He was clear. Don't look to him for all the answers. He knows that Guardians in the fight have a valuable perspective. So to start this discussion and provide their thoughts, I've gathered a great team of experts. First, my teammate, Charles Galbraith, Senior Space Fellow here on our Mitchell team. Next, we've got Brian Flasher Goodman. He's currently a student at a prestigious Harvard program for developmental education, but he's also a seasoned space operator. And last but not least, we have Tom Pumper Nichols from True Anomaly. Now, as many of you will remember from an earlier episode, True Anomaly is on the cutting edge of building spacecraft, software, and AI enhancing U.S. capabilities. And this includes range and training capabilities. Hey, Tim. Thanks. Great to be here. Hey, Tim, thanks for having me on. Really excited for what's going to undoubtedly be a great conversation. Did just want to add, though, that although I'm affiliated with the Space Force, that nothing today that I say reflects policy of the DOD, the government, or the service. It's all just my personal take, so wanted to get that out there. Thanks. Thanks for having me on today. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Appreciate it. Great. Thanks, guys. Okay, right off the bat, let's talk about why deterrence is so important for the Space Force. I mean, the last thing we want is a war in space. General Saltzman's theory of competitive endurance is all about the United States being and staying ahead of our adversaries, so they never try and strike first in space. It really all comes down to our adversaries knowing there are consequences if they cross certain lines. Now, this space-integrated deterrence concept is still being developed and unfolding fast. I mean, just a few years ago, you didn't even talk about conflict in space if you were in uniform. So, Charles, I want to get your take. What's the CSO trying to get at with this concept? Well, I think the first and most important aspect of this is that we don't want to get into conflict in space, have a terrestrial conflict extend in space or have a conflict start in space and move back to the terrestrial sphere. It's disadvantageous for everybody because we run the risk of creating debris or damaging the satellites that the rest of the world and all of us depend on on a day-to-day basis. So what can we do to make sure that we always stay short of achieving conflict? And that's why it's competitive and endurance. So what we're trying to do with the the theory of competitive endurance is increase the resilience of our architecture so that it's less tempting to attack and achieve a quick win for your short-term objectives, increase domain awareness so that we can start to attribute irresponsible behavior, and then responsible counter space campaigning. I think the key word there is responsible. Again, we don't want to have long-term debris. We want to de-escalate as much as possible. But if needed, we have to be able to respond with, with all forms of, of potential force. That includes terrestrial, it includes cyber, it includes in space. And that's a relatively recent big change is that we're talking about possible conflict in space. There are a lot of other nuances out there, and I think there are other aspects that we might want to consider as, if we try to dissect competitive endurance and, and expand that concept out further. But that's the essence in a nutshell, and I think it's, it's a great starting point for our discussion. Thanks, Charles. Okay, Tom, before you co-founded True Anomaly in your current position, you were a space weapons officer. And for the audience, that just reflects the top end of the military's tactical and operational training. So can you tell me how and why you would say these discussions have evolved since you left the service? Yeah, Tim, absolutely. I'd start by saying that this, the General Saltzman's theory of success it didn't even exist when I was in the service. In fact, the, the Space Force being so new didn't have a theory of success or 
as other domains call it, a theory of victory to begin with. One of the things I think that's really worth highlighting is it, it's called a theory of success. It's, it's competitive endurance for space superiority and not space supremacy. And, and I, I don't know if I need to go into definitions of those with, with the audience, but I just thought that was a really important takeaway to, to and, and it kind of gets in later. We'll talk about the different lines of effort and, and that'll, that'll help explain you know, I, I think why he, he talks about superiority as opposed to supremacy, but I think that's that's important to note with just the name of the theory itself. It's all about balanced competition, which is which is very important for the way that that we talk about art force design, architecture, and the things that you know have been discussed previously. But I would say the narrative, the the conversation about the theory of success is is new and even for me being out of the military is very helpful for industry in aligning what they're building with what the service needs great thanks and so flasher you're currently operating in this contested environment today so what are some of your thoughts on integrated deterrence yeah, good question, Tim. The idea of integrated deterrence kind of resonates with me pretty strongly. And to show why, I'd like to quibble with a little bit of a piece of conventional wisdom that I hear in the community all the time about the last thing anyone wanting is a war in space. I actually believe there's really strong incentives for a potential adversary to take a conflict to the space domain. And it's these incentives that make deterrence a critical necessity. I mean, if the incentives weren't there, there'd be no threat to deter to begin with. And so for my part, I kind of see three key asymmetries that entice adversaries to taking hostile actions against critical U.S. space capability, be they civil or commercial or military. Although truthfully, I'm not convinced that China and Russia make the same distinctions that we do regarding civil, commercial or military architectures. So the first kind of asymmetry I see is an asymmetry of dependency, particularly when it comes to projecting power across the globe. U.S. space power is bottom line irreplaceable when it comes to projecting power to the other side of the Earth. We need PNT for munitions targeting and force tracking. We need SATCOM for over-the-horizon communications, both in theater and back to national command authorities here in the States. We need overhead reconnaissance for intelligence collection, especially in situations where air superiority can't be assumed, as it is in several potential hotspots. An adversary can cover down for a loss of their space capability with terrestrial capability. You know, for example, line of sight radios, also ter there's terrestrial PNT capabilities. Researchers in China in the last couple of years actually produced a paper indicating how long range terrestrial navigation systems can cover down in these situations where space based PNT bay Dow is unavailable. Uh, the U.S. would struggle to manifest a similar capability in a power projection scenario for some very technical reasons, which, which we can jump into if we'd like. But suffice to say that a technologically advanced adversary can expect PNT if they're fighting close to home. We can't. So that's kind of that asymmetry of dependency. I see an asymmetry of escalation in space compared to other domains. That's kind of number two. Adversaries probably view it far more politically palatable to initiate hostilities in space than elsewhere in other domains. Probably, you know, except for cyberspace. There's a few reasons for this. So for one, hostilities in space limit escalation by removing the possibility of human casualties. I believe this is why we're seeing most counter Ukraine and counter NATO efforts by Russia taking place in unmanned sectors, namely uh, cyber attacks, uh, action against unmanned aerial vehicles like the Reaper the Russians put in the Black Sea earlier this year, uh, and the various forms of counter space electromagnetic warfare. So maybe a little bit differently, as the cost of war goes down, the probability of conflict goes up, and human casualties is one of those costs of war that is certainly significant. Therefore, we should expect to see these type of tactics, the tactics against unmanned systems in particular, especially in the early phases of conflict. And if I'm right, the asymmetry of escalation predicts that more destructive actions will occur in unmanned areas, especially space, as a conflict intensifies. And the reason that I say especially in space is because of this third asymmetry and asymmetry of impact. In short, it's far less expensive in terms of time, money, opportunity cost, and war fighting capacity to kill a satellite than it is to build and field a new one. You know, and I know that's a problem that companies like True Anomaly are getting hard after, but the asymmetry of impact holds in a fight tonight type scenario. And this asymmetry of impact is more severe in space than in other domains, particularly in these power projection scenarios which implies that adversaries would be incentivized to target more space systems and systems in the cyber or other domains. So what does all this have to do with integrated deterrence? 
but all ties back to integrated turns in this kind of critical way. I believe these three asymmetries provide a justification for the importance of integrated deterrence, especially in space, and it provides a coherent foundation, uh, the why behind uh, General Saltzman's theory of competitive endurance and its implications for the nation's overarching integrated deterrence strategy. So that's this is this is the why behind it all. Yeah, if I could jump in on that one. So I really appreciate your breakdown of the different asymmetries involved here. I do think there's some overlap and and dependency and impact potentially, but that's not to undermine the point that you made. And and I think you're absolutely right. One of the main attributes of our space reliance or space dependence is what adversaries like China have recognized and why they're targeting it in the first place. It's Traditionally, we've had this offense-dominant view of space, and that's inviting potential aggression uh, against our assets because they are vulnerable, because they are so heavily relied upon, because we can't project power, as you identified, like we would like to. And we always want to be playing the away game, and so it's absolutely important for us to, to do that. And so the changes that ripple because of the theory of competitive endurance to increase the resilience of our architecture and our domain awareness are absolutely those things that I think begin to erode those asymmetries that you identified. Uh, On top of that, while, yes, um, when they play the home game, so to speak, uh, they can use terrestrial means of communication and navigation, and certainly they know their uh, terrain better than we do, they are still also relying to a much greater extent, they being China, on uh, space-based communications, navigation, and certainly intelligence which I think is going to be critical to them when they try to employ their anti-access area denial capabilities to keep us out into uh, further and further uh, island chains uh, from their east coast. Yeah, so so Charles, great inputs. For my part, I just want to delineate between the asymmetry of dependence and the asymmetry of impact. The asymmetry of dependence is we need space more than them, and the asymmetry of impact is it's way less expensive in terms of a couple of different categories to kill a satellite than it is to field one. The asymmetry there is like, especially I'm thinking in, in relationship to like the cyber domain where, where network capability, especially in today's age, can come relatively inexpensively, but satellites remain a huge investment of time, money, opportunity, cost, and war fighting capacity. Probably need to, like I said, need to rename that asymmetry of impact, but just to clarify what it is I'm trying to say. Yeah, great. Thanks. And, and Tim's looking at his watch telling me, hey, we've got other things we got to talk about. So, so Tim, back to you. Great. Now, way to lay out the reliance that we have on space. So now, guys, the CSO has laid out three tenets to this theory. And let's kind of walk through all of them. And to be able to tie this all back together, the first one talks about avoiding operational surprise. That's being able to have the level of domain awareness needed to achieve space superiority. So what are some of the improvements that you guys have seen in sensors and some of the decision support tools that are starting to be used to get after this tenant? So as an operator, I think the most obvious answer, um, at least within the space operations community, is some kind of a modernized tool set that can ingest raw observations from sensors, both on orbit and on Earth, and then quickly and reliably produce orbital state products that can be disseminated to users at tactically relevant speeds and this is really important, across multiple classification levels. Ideally, all of the technical orbital data can be presented in something like a space common operating picture, which the humans charged with rapidly diagnosing situations and making decisions can use to do some sense making. And right now I do see a gap in the availability of rapid dissemination of orbital data that informs space cops that few that common operating pictures that fuel strategic and tactical and operational decision-making. Tim, what I'll add is is you asked about sensors and decision support tools. I also think it's really worth noting that organizationally, we've seen a change with the mission of space traffic management moving to the Office of Space Commerce, which leaves the Space Force the mission and focus on space domain awareness, which is this first tenant that you've discussed. I think this is also a good kind of delineation when people ask, you know, what's the difference between SSA and SDA? Why did we make that terminology change? SSA was mostly about traffic management, collision avoidance, and this military mission of avoiding operational surprise is is exactly what you're describing, which is 
understanding the capabilities that that adversaries are deploying so that we can prevent you know miscalculation prevent adversaries from from taking action against our high value assets in space obviously being a true anomaly this is a tenant that we are pursuing heavily with our deployment in of our first two spacecraft jackal in in february of next year their mission is focused on providing that actionable information to decision makers under the United Space Domain Awareness umbrella. Our focus is primarily on the close object, uh, close proximity characterization of resident space objects, but uh, our, our capabilities will be used for, you know, just general domain awareness, metric observations and tracking things in space. Uh, as far as decision support tools, I, I think you, uh, Flasher kind of highlighted the importance of that. It, it's not, it, just receiving data it's it's analyzing the data and making it actionable and so there the decision support tools are not just and you know we've, we've had the same ones in the space force for 50 years it seems like i don't i don't know when spadoc and, and cavenet were created but you you can see ssc you can see space rco getting after these using new technologies innovations and and to build better decision support tools, not just for general officers and, and government leaders to make decisions, but for tactical operators to do their mission, do their job. Yeah, so I see this in, in really four uh, main areas. The first is the, the sensors, right? Where do we have our sensors? What type of data are they collecting? Do we have enough of them for the growing number of uh, objects that are in space, both active and debris? So that that's one. Things like Jackal, things like GSAP, things like Im improvements to the SSN, as well as, as new systems like Space Surveillance Telescope, DARK, those are all great additions there. But then, as you both have talked about, you need to make sense of that data. And I think because there is so much of that data available and more will become available in the future as we have more sensors, you really need to be able to exploit that data using artificial intelligence and machine learning to identify patterns of behavior, what is normal, what is not normal, what, what looks like a threat, what doesn't look like a threat, et cetera. And then the decisions that, that you need to be informing, that has to be done in a timely fashion so that the decisions you make are not ex post facto, right? They, they need to be in time to actually prevent an adverse reaction. And, and the fourth element then is that data has to be shareable. If we play that we have a secret and we can't tell you, but boy, something bad might happen to you soon, that's not going to do anybody any good. And also, if we're trying to attribute what we consider to be irresponsible or reckless behavior, if we can't share that information with, with the rest of the world to call out those bad actors, uh, then we're not doing any good. So I think there's those four elements there that we, we need to be expanding. Yeah, and Tom, I'll uh, augment what you said real quick, and I want to really tip my cap to my brothers and sisters in the SDA community, because uh, as I was looking at it, the tools that they're using, like Spadoc, CaveNet, I mean, these are tools that were conceived and initially built during the Jimmy Carter administration, and it's nothing short of miraculous that they've been able to keep the SDA game going for as long as they have to the extent that they have, given the tool sets that they're using. So everybody that's involved in the SDA community right now has earned my deepest respect. And good Lord, I can only think of what these folks will be able to accomplish if they actually get some modernized tool sets. Yeah, thanks so much for that. And just to make sure that we're clear for the audience, when we utilize the term SDA, it's, of course, we've only got so many letters that we can make acronyms out of. We're talking about space domain awareness versus the Space Development Agency. But it's a really great discussion point. And again, you started... As I was listening to you guys lay that out, it literally was laying out what we talk about when we talk about a JADC2 environment of being able to make sure that we've got the right information at the right time to the right shooter at the right place. We're just, what you guys just talked about was taking that and putting it in the space domain, making it no different than any other domain as we go forward. So great. I appreciate that. So as you guys know, space domain, it, does have some unique capabilities, meaning it's just physics when it comes to the predictability of things on orbit. So when you couple that with the time that it currently takes to kind of reconstitute the capabilities that are on orbit, it gives a advantage to being the first mover in a conflict. And that's exactly what the chief is trying to get after with his second tenant. So what are some of the efforts you see the Space Force doing and what other efforts should they be doing to deny this adversary advantage? 
Yeah, so as we've talked about before, the existing architecture that the Space Force inherited was largely built during a time when we considered space to be a fairly peaceful domain. I won't say benign because there's a lot of natural hazards out there in the space environment anyway. But we were not particularly designing our capabilities to defend against active threats like ground-based lasers, direct ascent ASAT, co-orbital, etc. And so as a result, based off of those asymmetries that we talked about earlier, right, it invites potential attack of these vulnerable targets. So what are we doing to get after that? One of the first things that we've done I got to stop saying we because I'm, I'm retired from the Space Force, but but it's it's hard. Uh, one, one of the first things the Space Force is doing is proliferated low Earth orbit constellations. So if you take out one of a thousand, it has much less impact than if you take out one of three. So that proliferation is one of the most uh, visible things, and that's that other SDA, Space Development Agency, that's really heading up that path. But there are other elements to provide mission assurance, which is what we're really trying to get after. There was a taxonomy that came out in 2016 from the OSD describing mission assurance. And it talked about reconstitution and it talked about defensive operations, but it also talked about the resilience and how it was made up of disaggregation, deception, diversification, distribution, protection, and proliferation. And those elements from that taxonomy were reiterated in the recent release of the unclassified strategy for space protection. That went to Congress just last month. And so it's great to see the recognition that there are other things that we need to be doing out there other than just proliferation, but that's a great first step. And then by also expanding the mission set from a traditional geocentric, for example, missile warning, to also do it from LEO or communications from, not from geo and low Earth orbit, you're diversifying those assets as well. So there's other elements that are, that are being part of that overall architectural shift. But certainly there's a lot more work that we can be doing to exploit the advantages of those other five or four resilience measures, not to mention reconstitution from commercial or partner nation assets, as well as uh, launching new capabilities uh, and, of course, defensive operations, which we're going to get to here in a little bit. I'll start by saying I think Charles covered uh, most of uh, most of the things I was going to discuss, the, the SDA tranche being a good one, and then the tenants of in reconstitution they talked about. I think the other one that's really important is, and we're going to talk more about it later, is, is the defensive aspect to this. And... And when I'm using the term, I'm, I'm kind of focused, Tim, when you and I were at the 50th Space Wing together, I made it my mission to work on validating tactics, techniques, and procedures for our, our Millstar AHF constellations who, you know, weren't built to defend themselves. And so the, just the ability to create survivability through actions, through tactics that can defend your own spacecraft it really falls under this second tenant, which is, you know, it, it's the best way to blunt that advantage by, you know, avoiding the threats to begin with. I think it, Charles did a great job of summarizing the resiliency and reconstitution efforts that the that the Space Force is looking at. And I guess the one thing I would also add on there is that the, in terms of reconstitution, I think you've probably seen in the news and in with the emphasis on the concept of, of rapid launch capability, the idea that when I lose a high value asset, I can quickly find one off the shelf and put it on a rocket and, and launch it to create that same effect that I was getting from the, the lost asset. But I think what's more important for reconstitution, what you've seen quite a bit of is commercial augmentation. And so the Ukraine conflict is a really good example of, of, of using Starlink for commercial augmentation of capabilities. I think what we're delivering with our Jackal vehicles will be another example of augmentation of existing DOD infrastructure and capability that gives the Space Force the ability to reconstitute the effects that they were trying to achieve. Yeah, I think that you're exactly right, Pumper. When you go and you look back to our time in, at the 50th, if the satellites and the constellation and assets that we were trying to protect and operate back then weren't the textbook definition of what General Hyten called his big juicy targets, then I'm not sure that I know what one is. Yeah, so thinking about this in terms of theory, um, which is kind of what's been at the front of my brain lately, is 
something that I hope will interest the the listeners and the the folks here in this conversation. But one one of the interesting analytical lenses we can use to make some sense of this is uh, offense defense theory, which is kind of borrowed from a broader international relations context. But uh, essentially, offense defense theory posits that the relative superiority of offensive capabilities and defensive capabilities in a given environment shape the approaches that different states take towards security and conflict. I mean, so it's a huge simplification, but, you know, for our purposes here today, it's easier to kill in an offensive dominant system, and it's easier to protect in a defensive dominant system. So generally speaking, again, offensive dominant systems incentivize aggression and moving first, while defensive dominant systems incentivize digging in, attrition warfare, those those types of things. So like as a thought experiment, you can kind of think of it like medieval warfare, but everybody's using swords and bows. So everybody's using swords and bows. It's offensive centric. So in response, armored knights and castling was used as a defensive pivot. And so the, the relative superiority of the of the next generation of warfighting technology was defensive minded. So the offense responds with siege weapons and trebuchets and cannons to overcome those defenses and then drive the balance back to the offense until the time of like tanks and trench warfare. And then on and on and on we go over the centuries. But overall, this offense defense theory suggests that when a system is offensive dominant, as the USSF pretty is already figured out, there exists a huge incentive to strike first. And offensive dominance also tends to incite expensive and dangerous and destabilizing arms races, which is another phenomena that I think can be argued that we're seeing, or at least we should be cautious of. On the other hand, the empirical evidence at least suggests that defensive dominant systems are more prone to stability. So what I see happening right now is a real-time application of this offense-defense theory. Uh, People are looking at the space environment and seeing the obvious offensive dominance, the first mover advantage, and they either know the history or correctly intuit that the offensive balance in space is destabilizing, and so we're going to take steps to remedy the situation. Theoretically, it means transitioning to a defensive dominant set of systems. Uh, Practically, we can see this through a couple of different things that Pumper and Charles already talked about. There's the the pivot to P-LEO. There is and all of the implications that complicate adversary targeting and limiting the impact that an attack can have on a given mission by distributing capability across nodes. You know, we can minimize a single satellite's vulnerability, and that's another way to kind of tip the scales a little bit towards the defense. I think all of those are good starts, but really keep the service should keep asking the question and keep considering other means of tipping the scales towards the defense. If it was me, I would start by considering some defense and depth options and asking what analogies, if any, exist between space and cyber here. Uh, system hardening when proliferation is impractical. And of course, as again, as these great minds have already discussed on this podcast, SDA systems for attack attribution. I think awareness and attribution are stabilizing defensive mind, defensive centric capabilities. And all of those start to erode this first mover advantage and the destabilizing impact that that has on an operational environment. One of the elements that we haven't really talked about, though, was cost. I mean, physical dollar cost. When it costs, you know, let's just say uh, $5 million to launch a direct descent ASAT against a you know, billion dollar satellite, that's a shot you're going to take multiple times every day of the week. But if it takes $5 million to do a direct descent ASAT against a satellite that costs 200 k you're going to go, well, wait a minute, it's not worth it. So that's a, a huge element uh, of the proliferation, as well as the whole acquisition strategy coming out of Honorable Cavelli and the Space Force to reduce the cost of our assets to make them less tempting targets in the first place. So I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of that, that, that financial cost aspect, as well as the, the cost of attribution and the the political and potentially economic ramifications of that. And then finally, as we're going to get to here in a second, the the, the military cost, the actual, we, we might reciprocate that attack, and then you're going to incur a cost as well. Yeah, Charles, what you just said is exactly why I need to be surrounded by great minds like yours and Pumpers and uh, Tim's. And I really mean that because everything that you just said was what I was trying to get after and the asymmetry of impact. And I need to copy and paste your words and then put them into this little theory that I'm trying to build out. So that was that was really well said, and you made me a better thinker by jumping in there. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Well, thanks. Now we've reached tenant number three. Now, this is a topic that has not historically been discussed, responsible counterspace campaigning. 
Now, for almost my entire career, you didn't even mention space and warfare in the same sentence. So this is definitely a new concept. Charles, a few months ago, you wrote a Mitchell paper on exactly this. What are some of the areas that you highlighted? Yeah, thanks, Tim. Well, so we've already talked about a lot of them. I mean, the theory of competitive endurance in terms of improving space domain awareness, improving resiliency, those are all important aspects. We also talk about the establishment of norms, what responsible behaviors look like. That, that's all important. That's all needs to happen. But unless we have the means to protect our assets and potentially attack an adversary's assets, we're missing a, a significant set of plays in our playbook. And let me be specific here. When I talk about attacking an adversary's space capabilities, it's not a space for space's sake battle here. What we're doing when we attack an adversary's ISR capabilities or their communications capabilities is protecting our fielded forces, our, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, out in harm's way. We're protecting them from adversary space-enabled attacks. So I think that's an important distinction that often gets overlooked in the discussion of counter space and, case, and space superiority. But, but where I go in the paper is that the, the steps that we've taken so far to improve our resilience and to improve our domain awareness, they need to go even further. Because if you want to have domain awareness enough to attribute an irresponsible behavior, that's fine. But if you need space domain awareness to be able to identify where an adversary's space capability is most vulnerable, know when they are most vulnerable, and how best to attack that vulnerability, that requires a whole other level of space domain awareness and call it space intelligence, if you will. Additionally, our ability to command and control our assets needs to improve. It's not just the satellites that were built for a peaceful environment. It was the command and control structure that we, we built as well. And so when you have long periods without contact, when you don't have continuous contact, or the ability to command and control all of your assets simultaneously, they become vulnerable. And so improvements in our ability to command and control our space assets is also critical. There are a few other aspects out there that also need to be improved. But those are the two that really come to mind. Okay. Well, guys, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about some of the highlights that came out of the Air and Space Forces Association Airspace and Cyber Conference a couple weeks ago. First, the Space Force got a new mission statement. Secure our nation's interest in, from, and to space. Now, I'd like to ask you guys, why is this change important? Do you think that it fully captures what the Space Force is doing today in its mission? Yeah, so I'll jump in, and at the at the risk of sounding like a company man, honestly, I, I really like it. Uh, in fact, I probably could go so far as to say that I love it. It's a great evolution over our old mission statement, which was a little clunky and honestly, read to me at least, like it was the victim of 18 layers of bureaucratic and legal reviews. I applaud the new mission statement's simplicity and that Guardians have a ton of intellectual space to debate what it means and, importantly, what it doesn't. I applaud its scope that the USSF has the nation's interests at heart. And one of the things the service should be always above is parochialism and interdepartmental rivalry. And I also applaud its specificity, uh, specifically using the word secure. In my mind, that's our job as guardians, secure the nation's interests. Exploration, science, and economics are really, really important. But ultimately, those are civil and commercial-led functions. The Space Force, in my mind, again, exists to provide security, like in the martial sense. I, I think it's brilliant. Hey, Brian, that was a, a, a great rundown of, of the mission statement and how it applies. And, and I agree with you. As a former Guardian, I love it as well. The secure piece speaks volumes in just a single word. And our nation's interests, you're right, we're, we're beyond parochialism. But what I love about this is it doesn't specify what those interests are. Our interests in space are going to continue to grow over time. And and what this means for, for us is that it's not just the interests of space, right? It's the interests of those that, that leverage space, those that, that require space to enable them to do their jobs. And so it protects those capabilities. It protects the benefits that others receive from space. Uh, but then it, it also leaves it to new interests that might be evolving over time. So I think that's great. In, from, and to, you're either going into space, you're coming from space, or you're in space. That is everything. And so for those that think it's too narrow, boy, you're wrong there. It, it covers every aspect of space operations. So I think it's a, it's a simple and yet profound uh, and powerful uh, mission statement. I agree. Well, this discussion has shown that our adversary's use of space capabilities to target and threaten the Joint Force is exactly what the Chief and the Space Force are trying to get after. 
One way they're doing that is they just established a 75th ISR, or Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Squadron, at Peterson Space Force Base. Now, this unit's focused on space targeting, and it's obviously going to be a key element to the competitive endurance theory that we've been discussing. So, guys, what does this activation mean for space warfighters? Yeah, so I was discussing a little earlier that the improvements that need to happen for space domain awareness to enable responsible counter space campaigning really gets after what I think the 75th uh, ISR squadron is going to do. It's understanding what those adversary space assets do, where they are vulnerable, and that could be on orbit. Uh, it could be in the link. It could be in the ground uh, infrastructure. But it, it, it's, a, it's a holistic view of that adversary uh, capability. And then identifying the right method to go after that. Uh, it, is it a, uh, a direct ascent ASAT that we have or, or that we might develop in the future? Is it a, a ground attack from a special operations team or an airstrike against a, an antenna? Or is it ground-based jamming like the capabilities we, we currently do have? So there's a variety of ways to get after adversary capabilities, and I, and I hope that the 75th is identifying all of the possibilities and the ramifications of each of those possibilities so that they can provide the decision maker all of the options available to them and, and, and to evaluate those options clearly. So I'm going to step a little outside of the mainstream here, at least what I expect to be the mainstream, and uh, maybe it's because of my background as a space operator, but I've never been fully convinced that intelligence operations should be separated from the combatant commands. Um, pulling from their website, the 75th uh, sees its mission as to prepare and present intel packages about a target and the system that's a part of it. Uh, and it, it just seems to me that the joint targeting process should be owned and executed by the combatant command, in this case, U.S. Space Command. So the question that kind of comes to my mind right up front is who is setting the intelligence collection priorities and deciding what kinds and what qualities of targeting products are acceptable? I know if I was the Spacecom commander, I would like to have the final word on how to prioritize target package development and be the final assessor of target package quality as it relates to operations in my AOR. Here, it, it kind of seems like the service or Spock is taking some ownership of the targeting process. And I think that that could present a few problems down the road. You know, I, I imagine it would be a very cumbersome process to have US space company to reach back to the space force at the geo or 06 level to articulate that needs aren't being met. Uh, just as one example, but you know, with that being said, I am very, very confident that the men and women of the 75th and US space com are going to execute their duties with an extreme amount of professionalism and skill. And truthfully, I haven't really been a part of the 75th uh, Intelligence Squadron discussions, so I, I might be missing something important or some important fact. But uh, in this in this case, it seems to me like the form follows function principle seems to be just a little bit off. Uh, nevertheless, uh, that the service is developing a focus on targeting and its implications for combat operations, that on the whole, I think is a very good thing. Yeah, I'm going to start by just echoing what Flasher said about the 75th personnel. The intelligence community was not able to actually develop the necessary target folders for these types of system to understand the type of effects that we could apply and what that meant for the larger joint force. And so I think the 75th being a service retained capability to develop these target folders on behalf of the combatant command is going to pay dividends for understanding the type of effects we need to achieve in the domain. Great. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion so far on the theory and your interpretations. So let me ask you this. As the Space Force is transitioning from operating in a peaceful domain that we talked about earlier to a contested warfighting domain, what do you think that looks like both in the near term and the midterm? Yeah, Tim. So I, th I think what you're asking is, what does right look like now and, and in the future? And unfortunately, what right looks like and what we're going to look like may not be the same thing because it is an evolving process. So one, right looks like what we had when we were in a peaceful environment, but then it, it needs to shift to recognition that we need to protect those assets that we had and that still remain and provide operational capability to us. So how can we secure what we have? As we mature and as time moves on, we'll be able to change what we have. So we're going to change exactly what we're buying so that our architecture looks different than it does now. Of course, all of this is constrained by budget. 
And of course, as we all know, we're currently in a CR, which means we're held to last fiscal year's uh, spending levels and even a fraction of that because we don't want to reach limits. And, and what that means is some of those changes to protect the capabilities we have and change the, 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 what we're purchasing in the future uh, has to be delayed. And so that's why I say that what right looks like and what we're going to look like aren't necessarily going to be the same thing for a while. Uh, but, it, but it is that, uh, that transition from uh, just vulnerable to vulnerable yet protected to not vulnerable. So one of the great things about being an operator, at least an operator at the CGO and kind of entry FTO levels is I don't have to think a whole lot about budget. I just get the tools. So I think I can take an official position of like budget schmudget. Uh, and I think right looks like a couple of different things. The first thing I think right looks like is we need the capabilities and the awareness to be able to really effectively diagnose these space enabled chill kill chains both on the blue side and on the red side. So we've, and I think the, the, the targeting initiatives from the 75th are going to play right into this well, but we need to really understand how space is contributing to lethality on the U.S. and allied side and how it's contributing to lethality on the adversary side as well. So once we have that sense-making suite of technologies, right looks like a flexible approach to joint fires and effects, like, you know, disrupt, deny, degrade, destroy. You know, in my head, I've kind of got a graph where, you know, along the horizontal axis, there's a duration of effect continuum. And on the vertical axis, there's a there's a, a joint effects severity, I guess you could say, continuum. And I think that we need options that we can pick from in all quadrants of that graph. So from like temporary partial effects to permanent total effects, all of that while keeping debris generation to a minimum. I think that there's a couple of ways we could get after that, but in my mind, I see electromagnetic warfare being a big piece of the puzzle. Great. Now, Popper, can you discuss how industry can support some of these advancements in the U.S. space superiority? I'm thinking like through space sustainability and stability efforts. Yeah, absolutely. And Tim, I'm going to kind of break this into two. I think the first piece that's really important is norms of behavior. And it's adherence to and setting the example of norms of behavior in space and and the peaceful use of it. I think the second part that industry and and True Anomaly specifically is really focused on in in this idea of of space security is, is providing capabilities focused on the operational test and training infrastructure for the Space Force. And so... I, again, I'll go back to the time when when you and I were at the 50th, and and we had those four stops, those Milstar, AHF, Discus, WGS tactics that were unvalidated. We did not have the ability with an on orbit range to prove whether or not we could execute defensive uh, reactions to threats. And I think this is a great place where industry can step up and provide not the space security capability itself, but the infrastructure, the range capabilities for the Space Force to test and train operators that if a conflict occurs, they have the right TTP and kit to do their job effectively. So those are kind of the two main pieces that I see from our perspective here at True Anomaly. Wonderful. Now, can you also kind of talk a little bit, since you you teed it up a little bit there, from your perspective, can you talk a little bit about the digital range application and the on-orbit range service? Yeah, absolutely. So the the two things we're we're working on for the operational test and training infrastructure. So the digital range piece, I like to describe it as in, you know, before you test something on orbit, you want to make sure that it actually works in in a physics environment that's realistic of 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 where you're going to test it. And so we are trying to we're building out right now the software capabilities to do digital test and training, and not just one mil star tactic. But in order to effectively understand how force packages in space work together, what the impacts of those force packages are onto joint forces, uh, you need to be able to incorporate every aspect of, of the space domain, but also terrestrial as well. So you need to model uh, the things that, that Brian talked about earlier. Uh, as far as on-orbit test and training infrastructure. I mentioned already the idea of having a a range architecture that can 
provide time, space, position information on other high value asset tactics execution. To do that effectively, you still also need the ability to do threat replication. And so if you want to validate a tactic on a Millstar, you need the ability to replicate the threat that you're going to practice that tactic against. We're also providing your, what the Air Force calls white jet trainers, but it's your standard training platform for understanding the combat discipline of orbital warfare. The idea of movement, maneuver, and space, the ability to do close proximity rendezvous and proximity operations, the Space Force lacks an organic training capability that can do that mission and train Guardians for when they get to their actual, you know, OW platform in the future. And so those are just a few of the initiatives that we're working on for both the National Space Test and Training Complex digital and on orbit. Great. Well, speaking of training and readiness, the Space Force is a little over four years old now, and they've established a field command that's focused on training and readiness known as STARCOM. Space Training and Readiness Command. So clearly there is a need for combat ready forces and that's going to underpin this theory. So Flasher, can you talk about some of the changes you've seen in training? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, every time I think about Starcom, I think about retired Colonel Jack Fisher, who came up with the name Starcom as a backronym because it fits so well in the Space Force. And it's another one of those brilliant moments that I tip my hat to. But um, to answer your question, Yeah, I've seen training significantly evolve over the years from like proficiency training to ensure that space operators can execute a checklist task and respond to system anomalies to more adversary centric model of training, which places the emphasis on contending with an aggressor determined to do you harm. Space flag, I think, is a great example. And I've also seen more emphasis placed on space capability and some of the more venerable large force employment exercises like red flag or some of the joint exercises. You know, in, in days gone by, space was a peripheral at best part of these events. And I think there's good reason to believe that the needle's starting to move and realistic representation of space capabilities in joint training and our inherent like indigenous training in the Space Force is advancing in leaps and bounds. So kudos to Starcom and the team for that. Thanks. And Popper, if I can just do a follow up from an industry perspective, going back to what we were just kind of talking about, how important is a U.S.-based supply chain and workforce. I mean, the bottom line, how challenging is it from your perspective to ensure a strong pipeline is there for both of those? I'll start with the workforce piece. And I would say just, you know, being in the military less less than two years ago and now in industry, I think that the space industry workforce is expanding faster than than any other um, industry right now. And, and part of the reason we selected Colorado as the headquarters is because the aerospace talent pool here is incredible. Uh, some of the best and, and brightest engineers are located here in central Colorado. As far as the supply chain piece, I, I think it's really important and it's always going to be a concern no matter what industry we're talking about, uh, especially as we're developing our spacecraft the supply chain protection, but also access is is critical to supporting the competitive endurance, the theory of success, the idea that we can't wait 15 years to think of requirements to actually put a new system on orbit, but the idea that we need to be able to rapidly test, launch, learn, and repeat so that we can we can build capabilities that can respond to, to things that are happening in the domain on, on quicker timelines that we, we are seeing other countries doing right now. And so I think that's that's very important for for industry. Thanks. And so one other concept that kind of came out from airspace and cyber conference was the concept of integrated mission deltas. Uh, now this is designed to all about being optimizing the mission by bringing the people, training, equipment, and sustainment all together in one organization. So can you guys talk a little bit, how does this differ from how units are organized today? Yeah, so uh, I really liked how General Saltzman laid this out. He said, every organizational structure has seams. And what we need to try to do is is minimize the the damage caused by those seams to minimize the, the impact. And in his view, aligning around mission focus is the best way to do that. 
And so he's, he's identified a, a couple missions like, like GPS as a potential here to, to prove this concept out. And so the, the funding for the sustainment, the, the sustainment and maintenance of, of the capabilities is now going to be in the hands of the operational Delta commander. Uh, because who, who better to understand the limitations and, and uh, what areas need to be improved to sustain and, and continue to provide the capabilities from that? This does not align the acquisition authority for new programs or for research and development under that same Delta commander. That still rests, with, rests within the PEO structure of Space Systems Command. But it does align so that the operations and the maintenance, the, the overall support for the mission area can, can occur under the purview of, of that one Delta commander. Tim, and the one thing I did want to bring up, and it's not directly related to your question, but I thought is is a very similar vein, is the idea of an integrated program office. And so General Saltzman talked about the integrated mission delta, and, and I think there's a lot of good to be had from that. But I think one of the problems that I experienced as an operator was, was the, the coupling between operations and acquisitions. And... One example of where the Space Force is getting after that is within the operational test and training infrastructure with the integrated program office at Starcom. So it is a combination of Space Systems Command acquisitions bodies sitting with and coupled with the Delta responsible for the test and training mission. And I think that's going to pay dividends in, in linking up the acquisitions and operations communities. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Unity of Command uh, and really all of the other time-tested principles of war. And I think that's what General Salzman's getting after here. You know, there's probably going to be some organizational churn as the transition is implemented. There's going to be some lessons learned along the way. But in the long haul, I really think history is going to remember this as a positive move for the Space Force for all the reasons that Pumper and Charles talked about above. Okay, guys, one final question here. Clearly, the chief has said the Space Force is still developing many of the processes needed to achieve space superiority that we've been talking about today. So he's asked for Guardians to be in and be part of that discussion. So what are your suggestions for Guardians? What should they be talking about, and how should they get their voices heard? I think the Space Force has been pretty clear on creating the forums necessary to hear those voices, and and you see that in the the new Space Force mission statement, right? That came from the bottom up. If I could give suggestions or mentorship to current guardians about what to say, the best thing I could say is voice your problems. Focus on the problems that you face in your day-to-day job and in your mission. And those are the things that need to be highlighted. I think there are a lot of ways to solve different problems, but we can't go about solutioning until we know what the actual problem is. So that's my recommendation. Yeah, so just to build on that a little bit, there are a lot of folks that have documented problems either in Air Command and Staff College papers or, you know, Senior Developmental Education, Air War College, SAS, et cetera, and those have been great. So if you're a a young guardian out there, those are out there for you to read. There's also, to be a little self-serving, a great body of work here at the Mitchell Institute and some other, you know, great think tanks out there too, looking at the problems that that are facing the the military uh, as we move further and further into the space domain. So ho- hopefully people out there are listening to this and, and, and thinking about it, not just, you know, you, listening to this in the background while they're, while they're doing reps on the workout bench or something, but, but also take some time to think about this. What is it that you do? Who uses that information or that service? What are the threats to it? How can you secure it, right? Think about those things and think about the ramifications of, of, of achieving those objectives. Yeah, and I, I might be stumping a little bit here, but I genuinely believe the Space Force needs some kind of semi-formal opportunity for Guardians to write, think, and respond to the key questions of the day. You know, it's one thing to ask Guardians to be in the discussion, and it's another to provide the environment where those discussions can happen. I think the Marines have a great model with the Marine Corps Gazette, you know, something like a by Guardians, for Guardians forum, maybe in terms of rigor, something between like op-eds and academic journals, where individuals can present and respond to ideas. I know a lot of guardians who have great ideas, but no place to express. And this is probably even more important. They have no place to mature them. You know, if if I was king for a day, I would absolutely find some industrious action officer to run point on that. Great. Those are great ideas. And if I can plug also for the guardians, the Mitchell Institute is here to be able to assist and be able to give you those places to be able to have that voice heard as well. 
Well, gentlemen, I, I can't thank you enough. Um, it's been great getting to talk with you today, and we are looking forward to continuing the discussion in the future. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Tim. You guys are awesome. Yeah, Flasher, Charles, thank you. And Tim, thank you for hosting us. Back to you, Slick. Tim, excellent job. Thanks for taking the stick. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.